Let's talk about the Giants. What a weekend. What a three-day span for the New York Giants and for GM Joe Shane and for head coach Brian Dable and for that whole crew, the whole front office, the whole organization. I can't remember a draft this good like initial reactions like in the grades that we've seen for the, for the for the draft so far. Just an incredible at least rounds through the third round. I think they had probably the best three rounds of a draft. Uh, I think I saw Patricia Trena was saying that she doesn't remember draft this good since 07, which is interesting because like in retrospect, the 07 draft really contributed to that Super Bowl in 07. I don't know that it really contributed too much to the 2011 Super Bowl, maybe a little bit, but you didn't have like a ton of pro baller, pro bowlers, all pros from that 07 draft but yet they were all solid quality contributors. So I would put this above the 07 draft already without them even having played it down. I know it's a little wackadoodle. Um, but I, I'm just really happy, really happy. You know, I, when we were talking about, you know, with the preview last episode, you know, I think I was, I had my, my mind set, I was set on, despite everyone mocking, mock drafting a wide receiver in that first that first round at the twenty fourth, twenty fifth overall pick. Um, I just felt like it was a better use of our draft capital to go after a day one starter, starting cornerback, and then try and weasel and maneuver and wheel and deal to get a day one starter at center because those are the two biggest glaring holes everyone's like we need a wide receiver one we need a, i don't know that we need a wide receiver one i just don't um you look at a lot of teams that are successful and maybe they do have a wide receiver one but it's the complimentary it's that that room really is that room performing uh, average to above average and not just the, you know, like when Justin Jefferson gets shut down on the Vikings, who else are you going to in Minnesota? You have TJ Hawkinson, obviously, but he's a tight end. Adam Thielen, where was he, you know, when Justin Jefferson's getting a double, triple covered, whatever. So you need to have the full complimentary buffet of wide receivers. And I, and I don't think wide receiver one was like what we needed the most from the get go. So I'm glad we did not go that route. I think uh, I'm ecstatic with the Deontay Banks pick, which I completely overlooked in my preview. Um, you know, I just trying to, <laughs> there we are. <laughs> there we are. So I, I love the pick. I started to see more of Deontay back Banks' name. Um, I actually signed up for the Athletic, and I started to see him. I think it was Dame Brugler. Brugler is his name. Brugler. He mocked Deontay Banks to the Giants. I think maybe Dan Duggan did. I'm not too sure. A lot of people saying, "Well, you need to give Daniel Jones weapons. You need to give him a weapon." I was like, "Well, you can give him. There's plenty of like it's a deep wide receiver class." Plenty of wide receivers go around. I don't know that there are many corners that are day one starters that you can find in the second round, third round. You know, obviously, like Richard Sherman was a fifth round pick, but it's kind of like not, I want to say crapshoot, but the likelihood of that happening is not high. Right. So um, Christian Gonzalez goes, or Devin Witherspoon goes number five overall to the Seahawks. Christian uh, Emmanuel Forbes, who I thought might fall to us at 25. Um, wouldn't that be nice? Would would have gone to the Giants and said he goes to the Commanders at 16. And then you have Christian Gonzalez, another name that was interesting, but I didn't think was going to fall to us. So I didn't really profile him in the preview. He ends up going 17 to the Patriots. And then we end up trading up one spot with the Jags, giving up a, a fifth and a seventh. So giving up our the pick 25, along with the fifth round pick and a seventh round pick to move up one to get Deontay Banks. His grade is a 6.37. And again, there's, there's, you know, you have these very weird arbitrary grading system where like 6.7 or like eight is the perfect prospect, like all pro. 
and then like seven is like perennial pro bowler and then for some reason they have this one area that's like 6.5 i want to say is day one starter and then they have like a six three to six four six two to six four that's boom or bust potential and then 6.1 6.1 or 6 6 is like could be eventually become a starter. It's like <laughs> what? So, of course, Deontay Banks is like a 6.37 which is boomer bust potential. Um, but he went ahead of Joey Porter Jr., DJ Turner, Keely Rango, Brian Branch, all of whom were in were uh considered to be in the mix for the Giants at at the 25. And we moved up to get him at 24 and I honestly couldn't be happier with the pick. And I'll tell you why. If you're a believer in next-gen stats, which I tend to believe, B. John Robinson, running back from Texas, is the number one prospect, college prospect, in terms of next-gen stats at a 96, which is considered elite. You have Bryce Young, quarterback Alabama, 92, elite. Christian Gonzalez, cornerback from Oregon, elite, 92. Will Anderson Jr., who went second or third to the Texans, who had a incredible pulled off an incredible move to get both Bryce Young and Will Anderson Jr., he's at 90 elite. Those are the only four prospects that are considered elite by next-gen stats. If you move down, the next category or level is considered good, and you have Deontay Banks at 87, which is good which is right behind Emmanuel Forbes, which is an 88. Um, And then if you look at, uh, move back up here, in terms of next-gen stats, the top overall athletic prospects, along with the top five each position, Deontay Banks is number two behind Anthony Richardson, who went number four to the Colts, I believe. But John Gaines is second, a guard from UCLA, DJ Turner, the corner from Michigan, and I don't even know how to pronounce that. Adi Tomawa... At a border war, at a bow war, defensive end from Northwestern. So, right. In terms of athletic gifts, being athletically gifted, physical prowess, guy's a beast. He's a freak. And it's a matter of technique, consistency, right? Those are the things that he probably needs to work on. The technical skills he needs to work on in order to get to that Pro Bowl, All Pro level. He's definitely our day one starter. I mean, like, I automatically think, given his size, you know, six foot, almost 200 pounds, um, can run, I think he ran a 40 and 435, I want to say, something like that. Can tackle well, um, man to man cornerback, and has some upside and zone looks. He is the, literally the perfect fit for the Giants because you can put him one on one in man on press coverage. And that uh, in wink system where he blitzes like crazy, we blitz more than any other team uh, in the NFL. So I I love the pick, and it automatically I tweeted this and I stand by it. It puts us, I think, as a defensive unit, it puts us in the top five with that pick. He hasn't played a single down in the NFL, and that's what I believe uh, where we're at. So in terms of what the experts think, what are the grades that are being handed out for this pick? The Ringers, Danny Kelly, gave it an A-, minus, saying it, uh, Deontay is a twitchy athlete with good size who plays with anticipation and coverage. Yahoo Sports' Charles McDonald gave him an A-, minus, gave us an A-, minus, saying he can strap up in man coverage and is perfect for Wink's blitz-heavy scream, scheme that makes quarterbacks scream, you know what I'm saying? Mel Kuyper Jr., Says he's fast and tough and did not allow a catch of, catch of over 30 yards all season. And I want to say that he didn't allow any receiver during his career to surpass 50 yards in receiving in any game. Pro Football Focus gave him a very good grade, saying, uh, gave us a very good grade, saying Banks is the third best corner on their big board, uh, can mirror wide receivers and produce a 72 grade, PFF grade, in his final season, the best of his career. Chad Reuter of NFL.com gave, gave us a B plus. Okay, Chad, tough guy. And saying that Banks has a nice speed, size speed combination and look fluid during workouts of the combine. I love it. Wink loved it. You know, he almost squeezed the life out of Joe Shane after that pick. He was so happy. You know, Banks saying that uh, it felt like family already. So we're off to a good start there. And who knows with, you know, coming in under the tutelage, the wing of Adoree Jackson, who probably is uh, seeing the last, this might probably be his last season with the Giants. 
um, it's important to get uh, someone to step up in that CB1 role once a Jackson moves on, and then you have to draft uh, draft again. But my God, our defense, I feel really good about our defense moving forward. And then I was thinking, okay, I'm going to go center. I don't want to go wide receiver in the second round. I want to go center in the second round. And sure, show enough, we did. Minnesota Golden Gopher center John Michael Schmitz with the 26th pick of the second round, 57th overall. Yeah, 6 3 3 hundo. He's a big boy. <laughs> big boy. I can't imagine trying to get around that to, to get to the quarterback, but uh, he has the size and strength to earn a starting role in his first season. And I'd be shocked if he doesn't start and can be a nasty on field finisher. Mel Kuyper said he is a steal and fills an immediate need. Top ranked center. Pro Football Focus gave us an elite grade for this one, saying if we made this pick in the first round, nobody would have batted an eye. Hmm. And we led all centers with a 92.3 PFF grade in 2022, graded well both on zone and gap plays, a big guy that can really move and was a four-year starter, one of the best run blockers of the position to enter the draft in recent years. He is 24 years old, so it's not like you know um, he's too young for the spotlight, the stage. I think he's uh, mature enough and old enough to step right in and uh, and perform. Sporting News, Vinny Iyer gave it an A+. Plus saying he'll be a long-term snapper and line leader for them, for the Giants, uh, as the draft's best pure center. I guess the other option was Joe Tippeman. I think that's how you say it, Joe Tippeman. He went to the Jets as they ended up losing, what was it, McGovern to the Bills. The Athletics' Scott Do- Doctorman, um, he gave the pick an A, saying... Uh, <laughs> Schmitz is big, thick, and experienced. Started 36 games over four seasons, allowed just two sacks and three quarterback hits in the past three seasons. That is astonishing. And he was PFF's highest graded center, first team All American, a finalist for the Remington Trophy. SB Nation's Joseph Acosta gave it an A, saying uh, Schmitz is a tough and physical center who will play through the whistle. CBS Sports' Chris Trapasso gave it an A, saying he's an instant starter, large but nimble, reach blocks galore. Recovery ability is there too. Not dominant, but simply blocks everything. And that's all we're asking for, baby. You know, I like pancakes, but I don't need pancakes. Have you seen my gut? Bleacher Report's Brent Sobleski gave it an A. The 24-year-old is a ready-made pivot. He likely would have been in the first or second round conversation had he chosen to declare for the 2022 draft. First team All-American, polished and experienced, who's capable of taking over snapping duties. Pro Football Network's Ryan Gosling, yes, that Ryan Gosling, also gave it an A, saying he has fantastic hands. and But he does lack the kind of length that most uh, executives thirst for. But as long as he keeps his lower half moving, Schmitz is a fantastic running blo- run blocker, which I watched the NFL uh, draft show special from Barstool Sports, and Taylor Lewan was on the program, and he said that arm length is overrated. Like he doesn't have long arms and he's a what two two, three time pro bowler. So um I cannot I don't know if I could be any happier with that pick. A plus for me, dog. And then so in the third round, it felt like forever. Eight we had the 89th pick overall, it was the 26th pick of the third round. And by God. It felt like it was forever. It, it, it felt like, I don't know how this was possible, but how was 57 closer to 24 than 89 was not, like, it just didn't add up in my head. And it, the moment I tweeted that, Joe Shane then traded up to 73 <laughs> to take Jalen Hyatt, Jalen Hyatt, wide receiver from Tennessee, the Volunteers. I thought this dude was taller and bigger, but I guess it's just a, a, an optical illusion because he's six foot 176. If you, after watching his tape and seeing pictures of him, I was like, this dude's got to be like 6'2", 6'3", 215. You know, it just seemed like that body type. But no, he's more of like a Devontae Smith size, even though he looks longer and taller. I don't know. Very interesting. Uh, Mel Kuyper said the speedster is a deep threat, but he needs to refine his route running. Um, He had him as his fifth ranked wideout overall and said could sneak into the first round. So the fact we got this dude in the friggin' third round is so impressive. And that's that's basically the the gist. Like, if you need to know 
and there's a couple ways you can look at it, but like if you need to know how impressive this the the first day one day two haul was for the Giants and Joe Shane, the fact that all three of these players Schmitz, Banks, and Hyatt were projected to go to the Giants or mocks to the Giants at that first round pick at 25, all three were in the consideration the running there, and they got all three over the course of, course of three rounds is truly a magnificent feat. Now, the haters might say, well, maybe they got these players, Schmitz and Hyatt, so late because the other executives saw some major red flags or they were slipping because of XYZ. I choose not to look at it that way. I think that um, I think that we we worked it, Missy Elliott style, the right appropriate amount, and made some and saw picked and chose our spots. Who knows? Like how many times? And we said this in the preview. How many times have we seen the guys that we wanted? We get leapfrogged by some other team, the Eagles, the Cowboys, whoever. A rival leapfrogs us and takes the guy that we want. Joe Shane did not allow that to happen. Whether it's trading up one spot or trading up 16 spots. He saw the opportunity, saw the threat, and said, okay, let's get it done. We have 10 picks to play with. The later, the, the later day three picks, like we said, more of a crapshoot. You're not too sure about it. So it's like we have those in spades. We have those available. Let's go for it. And yes, he did have to give up a four. I think he had to give up a fourth to get to Hyatt. But you did you accomplished what you were setting out to do. What were the three major, major primary needs? Corner, center, wide receiver. Boom, boom, boom. Check, check, check. Steal of a pick. Ideal vertical threat from Sporting News. A plus. 33rd team. A plus. The most explosive wide receiver in the draft. Hits top speed quickly. Polished. Understands how to run routes and set up defenders. And I, yeah, I mean, I saw a film breakdown from Bobby Skinner of Talking Giants, and this dude can jet, like leave people in the dust. And he has the ability to, like, like uh, 33rd team said, to set up defenders where it looks like, uh, you know, you're just setting up thinking that you're going to go outside, cut inside. Now, he does get a little lazy on certain routes, I guess, when he knows the ball is probably not going to come to him. Just like, I think you looked at the film breakdown of Deontay Banks. There are times where he does, there are lapses, maybe mental lapses, and that can, and that, and it does, ends up not really biting him in the ass, but you can see like it happens. And I don't know that you can do that at the, at the pro level. Like you have to be 100% all the time. Uh, Ryan Gosling, again, hot goss coming in with an A grade saying, uh, Hyatt is pure unadulterated speed threat. An extra gear has an extra gear that, um, you don't see from any other receiver in this draft class, which is like really, really cool to see and hear. So um, SB Nations, Joseph Costa gave it an A, saying he'll stretch the field. The Athletic Scott Docterman gave it an A minus, saying uh, Hyatt ran a 4.4 at the combine, but his acceleration dwarfs that time. He had 20 catches of 20 plus yards, seven catches of 50 plus yards, uh, led the nation in virtually every deep ball category. Last season, he caught 67 passes on 89 targets for almost 1,300 yards and a school record 15 touchdowns at 18.9 yards per catch. He won the Bolitnikoff Award as the nation's top receiver, became the 13th unanimous All-American in Tennessee history. Uh, he's a burner. And I, I, I want to say, and this stat could be completely wrong, but he averaged something like either 20 or 40 yards per touchdown reception, <laughs> which is just... Absurd. I mean, he went off against Alabama. He had uh, five touchdowns and 170, 270 receiving yards. So, and that's a that's an elite, top notch defense. Um, so right there, I'd say if we just came away at those three players, I think it's still a, an A plus draft. But we still had a couple, a few more picks to go. Of course, the fourth rounder uh, went away once we got Hyatt. In the fifth round, we gave one of those away to the Jags to move up one spot to get Deontay Banks. So our next pick was a 37th pick. This was a compensatory pick, 172nd overall. And we went running back. Eric Gray, Oklahoma Sooners. He's, uh, I think it's like 5'9", 200 pounds. So a little bit on the smaller side. Pro Football Network gave it an A. Gave us an A for that. One of the most underrated backs in an incredibly talented class. Very cool to see. CBS Sports gave us a B plus, saying uh, 
Gray is a versatile weapon with a deceptive elusiveness and a quickness that is more impressive than his speed. He's not a fast dude. I think he ran a 4640 or something like that. Hard to disrupt in equilibrium, which that was the probably the coolest trait that I saw being thrown around. Hard to disrupt equilibrium. It's like a weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Like, is that Eric Gray? <laughs> the athletics Dan Brugler said that uh, Gray put together a career year as a senior, leading the Big 12 in rushing yards per carry at 6.4 and then ranked second in rushing yards per game at 113.7. Quick to gather, plant and burst with the explosive cutting skills to shake defenders and pick up chunk yardage. Mm. His 44 carries of 10 plus yards in 2022 ranked number seven in the entire FBS. He isn't an inside grinder, but he stays behind his pads with low center of gravity and pacing that help him pinball off contact. Fuck yeah, dude. I almost love those kind of players more. It's just like you can't bring them down. They're just like bing, ba, bing, 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 bing. Like that, that's really cool to me. So um, obviously I want Saquon back. I don't know what this means for the likes of, I guess, Gary Brightwell. Is he on the hot seat? Because I don't know that. Are you going to carry four running backs every game? Is he going to be using special teams? I think that's a high possibility or high probability because right now I think you had Brightwell returning kicks. Now is Gray going to return kicks alongside Brightwell? Because I know that Gray, I don't think he returned kicks or punts his senior year, but his junior year he did return a few kicks and punts, so maybe there's an opportunity there. You know, once uh, to get his legs underneath him and contribute that way. Uh, NFL.com's Lance Zerline said that Gray is a decisive creative runner with the size and skill set for three down consideration at the pro level, a reliable threat of the backfield with soft hands and a willingness to block. That's a key. You know, you got to remember that. It's a key phrase willingness to block and uh, three down backup with a future starter potential. I like that. The 33rd team said he's a solid three down running back prospect with adequate tools and instincts, tough, decisive runner who lacks juice when he hits the second level, which is kind of a womp womp. But at the same time, nice to have another guy that can grind out the tough yards and get that extra yardage, a la maybe an Orleans Darkwa or even a Wayne Gallman, you know, he was always ended up, you know, getting positive yardage after the contact, um, which I don't know that you see that too often from Matt Breida. Like I like Matt Breida, but I don't know that he um, is going to give you uh, that yards after contact. Um, Pro Football Focus gave Gray an elite 90.6 PFF grade in 2022. He graded well on both zone and gap plays. A little on the small size, but he posted a 96.2 elusive rating, one of the best marks in the running back class. His, uh, as we mentioned, 44 carries at 10-plus yards last season, his first among Big 12 running backs. Again, another great pick. Um, we knew that we probably had to address running back with the Saquon situation being what it is. Um, knowing that Brita is on a one-year contract, back on a one-year contract, not really knowing what you have in Gary Brightwell. It's like this is a pick for the future, right? We're going to looking out for the future, making sure that we're well stocked for the future. Um, so I, I don't hate it. Needed a depth piece there, and we got it. Speaking of depth, in the sixth round, the 209th overall pick, 32nd pick of the sixth round, this is the compensatory pick from the Chiefs. We picked Larry Hawkins the third, a.k.a. Trey Hawkins, that's what his best friends call him. I'm his, I'm, we're, we're Biffs, we're BFFs, so I call him Trey. I'm not sure that you can, but you can call him Sir Larry. Old Dominion defensive back. Finished his senior season with 60 tackles and two picks. Started all 25 games the past two seasons with noticeable improvements uh, in the senior citizens, senior citizens, <laughs> senior season. Penalties dropped from six to only one in 2022, which is good to see. I know that that was, uh, an issue or concern with Deontay Banks is that when he does get beat or, uh, you know, uh, does mess up in coverage, he has a tendency to like tackle the guy, <laughs> just straight up tackle the guy, which I don't know that I hate a lot of the time. It's like, I don't want to get torched for a touchdown here. Let's just tackle him. Take the, take the, take the yardage, penalty yardage. Um, so it's good to see that he cut down on that. Cause I know that, uh, that's sort of a problem with Darnay Holmes right now. So 
Just something to work on. Tall, long, and limber body type with the gather and go skills to quickly transition vertically and stay attached to receivers, which I dig. I know that that's another that was a, another positive trait from Deontay Banks was his ability to you know if he does get beat on a on a vert that he has the ability to catch up and be in that hip pocket. Um, his uh, Hawkins long speed is impressive. His average lateral agility will put him in recovery mode and shows up as a tackler. Um, will get clingy and needs to prove his play recognition. So, but uh, I think he's kind of a bigger body. I want to say he's like six three, which is is good because I don't know that we have a ton of bigger bodies in the mix in our secondary. So, uh, you know, I know I I talked about that in the preview. Like I sort of miss the days of having like a six two six three DB that can match up and and own physically own opposing wide receivers. In in that five yard contact zone, ESPN Steve Munch said uh, Hawkins is tall and long with good top end speed and quickness. Tough and tends to wrap up, which is great. We love guys that don't miss tackles. So uh, I like that pick as well. Lots of young talent in that secondary. Someone has to step up, right? <laughs> I feel like we have so many young draft picks that we have in the in, in, back there that at that third level. That uh, my God, if just one of them pans out, that would be just phenomenal. You know, I know Cordell Flott made some strides toward the end of the last year, and uh, it would be nice to see. Does Aaron Robinson ba- bounce back and have a good sophomore effort? Does Rodarius Williams actually is he still on the roster? I don't know. Oh, jeez. On to the seventh round, the last round. We had a few picks in the seventh round, but we ended up giving up. One of those in the Deontay Banks trade to move up with uh, one with the Jags. So we had two left after that. The the first of which was the 243rd overall. This is the 26th pick of, this, of the last round. Jordan Riley, defensive tackle from the Oregon Ducks. 6'5", 330. Uh, that's about it on that dude. <laughs> that's about the full scouting report that I have on that guy. Because you look, there's like this Ross score, whatever the hell that is. I know that Deontay Banks had like an elite Ross score, like everything was in green. You know, it's like nine points something out of ten. Jordan Riley's Ross score was all red. It was like poor, poor, poor. Every category was poor, and then size was just lit up in the brightest of greens, almost a full ten. He is a big dude. But he's not agile. He's not quick. He's not speedy. He's not explosive. Doesn't and for some reason his like overall size great, but his hand size not and arm length not considered elite or whatever or uh you know high up on the Ross score. <laughs> um. So yeah, I mean this is just I mean that's the the feeling here is I don't know after seeing the likes of like Ellis and who is the other dude that are just getting tossed around and, and they're big bodies that it's like maybe we don't want to go down this road again um I think this was from I don't know Nick Filato but 10 total pressures and a sack in his career with 19 stops according to PFF so you pair him with uh, DJ Davidson, who only played a handful of games last year and got hurt, who's another big fella. You pair him with uh, Nacho, our pickup from the Bucks, who's 30, 31. And our newly signed Ashawn Robinson from the Rams. Now you're starting to feel a little bit better about your depth in the interior defensive line. Someone that can at least uh, help out Leonard Williams and Dexter Lawrence, give him a breather, give him some... Uh, some rest here and there, save them for the playoffs. So, you know, I think that was something we wanted to address, and we did it. And then our last pick, 37th pick of the seventh round, 254th overall, another compensatory pick, Javarius Owens, safety from the Houston Cougs. Good size and frame, former corner, turned safety, average to good athleticism, movement skills, closing burst and speed, good play strength, toughness and physicality. He's a depth piece and a special teamer. So... If I had to guess, Bobby McCain will start opposite um, Xavier McKinney, and uh, and that's that. So, what any positions that we missed? As you know, we had ten picks going into this, so we ended up with seven. So, um, 
I think a lot of people thought we might go quarterback, right? A, a young guy that can, when uh, Tarod Taylor moves on, can step in as the backup. We didn't do that. Uh, tight end might have been a position that we were kind of considering and looking at, but it was not necessary, right? Like we have Belly, we have Waller now. And uh, so tight end might have been a position that we might have addre- needed to address, but not really. Interesting that they took another DB after Deontay Banks. Um, so, I, I I mean, we pretty much checked all the boxes. We addressed everything that we needed to address. I mean, a, I guess A plus is a little out of control. I give it an A, A minus. Like, I don't, I don't, this is definitely one of the better drafts that we've had. You know, to come away with two day one starters and another guy that can probably see a lot of the field and might even become a starter towards the end of the season. I don't know. Um, as far as your offensive look goes, where does Hyatt fix into the, where does he rank? Where was the order of things in that room? You know, I, I think you have, people are thinking Paris Campbell, Wandale, Slayton Hodgins are your top four, or does Hyatt move in above Slayton and Hodgins? It'll be an interesting battle. Please God, no, uh, no more three, four guys going down to injury <laughs> to start uh, to start the season. Can have that happen, but you got to feel pretty good about the the hall. Um, and for everyone saying, "Well, we didn't draft a guard," like what happened to the guards? We needed a guard. Okay, okay, okay. Let's just take a step back. Or a linebacker was another one. So guard and linebacker were two positions I thought maybe maybe we could have gone in and and picked up a linebacker or a guard. You have a Karaki at linebacker. You have Beavers coming back. McFadden. Right in the mix there. Who else we got? Jared Davis, who now has a full off season to absorb the playbook and get more up to speed on things. Um, I think there's one or two more linebackers there. Carter Coughlin, maybe. So uh, it, that's a pretty decent room. You don't know what Beaver is going to give you, especially after the ACL. But that's going to be an interesting competition to keep your eyes on to who's going to be next to Kurake. Is it going to be Beavers? Is it going to be Davis? The more of a veteran uh, presence there. Um, we'll have to see. But guard is another situation where it's like, you know, we when we talked about the draft history, right, and the, the GM's track record in terms of drafts, when we looked at Joe Shane's first draft from last year, there was some like 10, 11 picks. Most of those dudes got hurt. Like, like Azudu was hurt most of the season, but when he came in, he was solid in some respects and not so solid in other respects. I don't know if it was pass protection, he's okay, run blocking, not so much, or if it was vice versa. So he was in a battle with Bredesen for most of the season before he got hurt. Marcus McKeithen didn't even see the field because he got hurt. So who knows what, after a full year of recovering and rehab and whatnot, getting back in the mix, is he someone that can compete? Shane Lemieux is also still in the mix somehow. <laughs> He's he's like the undertaker of uh, our guards. He just keeps rising from the dead. And then uh, obviously Glowinski, but you have a bunch of dudes that are competing for the for those spots. And I think that only competitive competitive competition breeds excellence. I don't know what that freaking saying is, dude. But so I don't know that you need to throw another guard on top of that. That's like not a day one starter. Do you know what I'm saying? So I think I'm okay with the guards. That we have once you start to recall, like, okay, we get McKeithen back, we get Azudu back, we have Bredersen again, Glowinski, Lemieux. I think there's maybe one more. So that's that feels all right. Tackle might have been another position where it's like I would have nice to been to get a depth piece, but we do have Parrot. We do have Tyree Phillips, I believe, again this year. Could be wrong about that. Um, so yeah, I mean, if 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 Andrew Thomas, Evan Neal, and John Michael Schmitz, those three core pieces can stay healthy all 16, 17 games, or most of those games. We're going to be in a, a, a pretty good spot. We can't be like, what was it the Rams? Or there was another team where like 14 different offensive line starters, which I think we went through that in 2020 or 2021, where it's like it was just so many revolving door of guys that just couldn't stay healthy. That offensive line, if Schmitz, Neal, Thomas stay healthy and we get some kind of crazy competition <laughs> of guys in the guard spots, then maybe Daniel Jones won't be the most pressured quarterback in the NFL like he was last season. You know, 
the fact that he was and still got us to the playoffs and still won a playoff game is is outstanding. Now, what I will say is, Jesus Christ, the Philadelphia Eagles. Can you take a take a break? Just take a break, Philly. Or should I say the Philadelphia Bulldogs? Like the Georgia Eagles. Like, I think they're gonna play all their home games in Athens this year. They're definitely an early favorite to win the SEC. Everyone's a friggin' Georgia Bulldog, basically. They drafted uh was it Jaden Jalen Carter, Jordan Jordan Carter, who was like who we're talking about grades. He had that seven seven grade, which is like perennial all pro uh player. And then they uh trade and get Nolan Smith, an edge rusher. I think they also got Keely Ringo. I could be wrong about that. Traded for DeAndre Swift, who I thought the Giants should have took a flyer on that. You know, um, I know it was only going to be for this year, but it was very low risk. It was like a maybe a million dollars or something like that, less than $2 million. And there's no like uh, dead sell- dead cap space if it doesn't work out or something. Um, I don't think you have to get, you might even get a compensatory pick something. I don't know. It was It was like, Wow, this is very appetizing. And instead, the friggin' Eagles got him. So, uh, yeah, the Eagles, dude. Continuing to bolster that defense, it's like you you think, oh, they lose all these guys at free agency, and then they just they just stack them up again in the draft. So I think the Eagles are probably, um, you know, we, we just, it's so nice to have Schmitz now anchoring the center of that the interior offensive line because at, le- at least it's like gives Daniel Jones like just maybe a half second more <laughs> to see Darius Slayton just flying down the sideline or now Jalen Hyatt flying down the seam. So I really like their draft. I think we're, we on paper, we're a better team than we were in t- last year. How many more wins that results in depends on our health, how healthy we stay. You know, if Darren Waller just gives us, 80, 75 to 80 percent of what his Pro Bowl year is. I think we're 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 due for a lot more dubs. I don't want to say we're I had us at 10 wins last year. We ended up getting nine. We probably should have had 10 if it weren't for John friggin' Feliciano. <laughs> but uh I could see us I could see us getting 10 wins. I think mean, that's the, I think that that's like the minimum this year. I think that's like the minimum. You know, and I think that if we can get to that 11, 12 range, I'd feel that feel great about it. But, you know, <clears throat> hard to compete with the Eagles and and even and still the Cowboys. You know, I think uh, what the Cowboys got Deuce Vaughn to pair with uh, with Pollard. So um, I think they got better. I trying to get a sense of the commanders. I didn't really follow much of their draft, but you know, getting Emmanuel Forbes, you know, the dude who led had the most pick sixes in college football history or some, some nonsense. Um, so they're going to be better. I mean, the NFC East was a beast last year and it's going to be a beast again this year. So, um, but I do think playing those, that level of competition twice, you know, six of those games out of your 17, at that level of competition, bears you pretty nicely for the playoffs, as you saw when we uh, f- when we squared up against Minnesota. So, I'm uh, I feel good, feel real good. I don't feel like we missed on anything. There was nothing that made me scratch my head or question anything. Uh, you know, I think the the coaching staff is super happy about it. The fans should be happy about it. I don't know how you can really complain about any of this and uh. It just, it just, I'm, I'm so amped for the season. The schedules come out May 12th, I want to say, Mother's Day, or not Mother's Day, but that week. So maybe two weeks, the schedules come out, and um, I'll make my predictions then, but you got to feel good. You got to feel good if you're a Giants fan, you know? And I know there's probably some, uh, you know, there's a little skittishness around trading up the last time we traded up for a corner in the first round it was deandre baker so there's a lot of there's a lot of comparisons to deandre baker going around um who i don't even think is in the league anymore which is fucking nuts but i don't get that sense with this guy deontay banks i i, I don't I don't think Wink would have really pushed for him that hard and put his stamp of approval on it that strongly if he didn't believe in him you know so uh feel good